colonial architecture is going to take on a number of different forms, and what you have to keep in mind is when they are leaving. They're leaving in the middle of, early to middle of the 17th century frequently, and so many of the styles that they're going to bring with them are going to be Tudor, they're going to be Elizabethan, they're not bringing with them the newer styles because they're not entirely aware of them. They're only just forming at the time. So many of the early settlers will use our very standard sort of English Renaissance uh, exposed timber construction with the daub and wattle in between and frequently thatched roofs. But this does not go on for very long because these homes do not hold up well in the Americas where the weather conditions are much more extreme than they are in England. So in the Northeast, we tend to see a lot of timber construction. They have a lot of timber available to them, so they will use it. Uh, and we're going to see the use of siding, which I'll get to a little bit later. This wood construction is based on the materials that they have and what they're competent to use. They're more comfortable with using wood because many of these people, even the farmers, are used to building with their hands and that's the material they tend to use. Whereas when we get into the middle colonies where we have a lot of Welsh, Scottish, uh, Dutch people coming in, they're going to be more comfortable using stone construction. We're going to see homes with, for example, that uh, split roof and the end chimneys, very much Dutch colonial in form. And of course, we're going to see a lot of Dutch immigration into the middle colonies. In the South, it's totally different. In the South, it's all about showing power. This is a plantation society, even very early on. And so they take on these massive homes, and they're massive because they need to have slave quarters, they need to have all the working spaces. These are more similar to a hacienda than they are to your standard Cape Cod up in the Northeast. But they are based on very pragmatic principles, despite their size. They're also based on the climate, something we'll get to later. Like now, climate and architecture becomes a huge issue. Now, up until this point, generally speaking, we're building for a single society with a single climate. But of course, north to south, there's huge climactic variations in the United States, and that's what we're going to see. We're going to see the development of clabbered siding. This is basically similar to the siding that we see today. And what they're going to do is they cut these pieces of wood. They generally feather them to one side, so they're thinner at one side and thicker at the other. And they nail them up. The idea is it can simply cover the material underneath the daub and wattle construction. Because, of course, that's going to be impacted by things like intense cold, snow, and rain. And so we see it in use in these old homes. Now, it's very, very similar to more modern forms that we see today, which basically do exactly the same thing. They protect the walls underneath. And of course, very quickly, they get rid of the entire plastering the outside of the house and putting clabbered siding over the top of that and build more in this method, where we have large wooden blocks put into place, they don't even cover everything. There would be gaps, and frequently those gaps will be covered in plaster or filled with plaster from the inside, but not from the outside. And then those are simply covered over. You could imagine doing the same with a skeleton frame structure, which is very similar to what we do in homes today. We'll also see the development of the shake roof because, of course, thatching doesn't hold up well to snow, at least not in large quantities. So what they do is they use cedar or other wood shake. Uh, preferably cedar, it's going to last the longest. It's resistant to rot and other forms. And it works very, very well. Uh, it's put up just like any other shingle roof. It lasts a considerable amount of time. Now, in New England, we will see them start to build a second floor into their homes, and the reason for that is actually heat. If I heat the first floor, the second floor will pick up that rising heat, and it will stay warmer. It also keeps the heat in the living area longer before it migrates out of the roof and elsewhere. 
this is actually a really great idea. And this is one of the reasons that in Wisconsin, if you're going to rent an apartment, get a second floor apartment or a third floor apartment, because if the person under you happens to use their heat a lot, well, you aren't going to be paying much. So it's the same basic idea building for efficiency. These are colonists. They don't have time to go out and get twice the amount of wood just because they want something different. Fireplaces will frequently be in the middle of the house. Now, the reason for that is they actually start at an exterior wall, but you could imagine a situation where they start to build around the fire. So they notice that there's a lot of heat escaping out the back, as we talked about with the Dutch uh, when I compared the English and the Dutch fireplace. So they build another room around that. And then they expand that. And eventually you find the fireplace in the middle of the house. And in fact, the same chimney being used oftentimes from multiple fireplaces or from multiple directions. So you might have a small one on one side and a larger one for the kitchen on the other and maybe even one upstairs. Now in the South, things are a little bit different. Heat isn't as big of an issue. And as their houses expand, they go from being one room deep, so in other words, only one room between the front and the back of the house, to two rooms deep, which means I need more chimneys. And in the south, they tend to be at the end of the house. So you get these double chimneys at the end of the house in the south. It's all coming from the practical idea that, hey, we need chimneys, we need heat, and how are we going to do this efficiently when we start widening the house? So let's talk about some of the materials that they have. Uh, we're going to see, apart from wood, I mean, uh, wood is a pretty obvious choice and we're going to see a lot of that, but we are going to see, uh, for example, field stone construction. So this is mortarless field stone construction. This is also known as ashlar masonry, A-S-H-L-A-R. And it refers to masonry where the stones are not physically glued together with mortar. We'll also get some interesting local variations. For example, the Stone Ender home in Rhode Island, where they are using that stone with mortar, but they're creating an area that is much, much larger uh, for the home and then combining that with the wood that we're used to in other construction methods. And of course, field stone is going to be a very common material. Again, in the middle colonies, it is more common simply because it's more available. They have it readily accessible. And the field stone homes that we see typically are going to be fairly random field stones where they're simply facing the front side of it. Uh, and it's not an even construction. It's very similar to those Dutch colonial rural homes that we were looking at before. The corners will often be very finished. So here we see some very nice squared off stones around the corners and around entryways and windows, but you'll notice everything else is fairly random. That being said, it's a very effective way of building. It's very efficient and it lasts a very long time. And of course, we will see brick construction as well. Now, brick is not as common in England as it is amongst the Dutch, but they're going to pick up these ideas from the Dutch and start building with it, especially as we move through the colonial period.